Um, hello everyone. Um, a very, very warm welcome to a special behind the scenes live stream at the Fitzwilliam Museum. My name is Hannah and I work for the University of Cambridge Museums and I am really, really excited to be taking you into a very cool place this morning. Um, so this is the first of uh, two live streams that we're doing today as part of Open Cambridge, which is all about going behind the scenes in some of Cambridge's um, most interesting and um, impressive institutions. So we're here at the Fitz and I'm here with Harry and Harry is going to tell us a bit about what he gets up to. So Harry, can you tell us a bit about what your role sure. is and yeah. where we are? So my name's Harry Metcalf, I'm a conservator of uh, works of art on paper. Um, we're in the paper conservation studio, one of two studios here at the museum. And I'm also one of two paper conservators. Um, I work mostly on the collection of prints. Um, and hopefully today I'm going to talk a bit about some of the work I'm doing on the mezzotints cool. in the collection. Um, I suppose you could roughly kind of uh, divide my job into three parts. The first part is uh, preparing objects for exhibitions. Uh, we have a number of temporary exhibitions every year at the museum, which include art and paper, and they generally last for sort of three or four months, and the reason for that is that um, paper is susceptible to light damage, and so we want to try and limit the amount of yeah. exposure some of these objects have. So that's the first part of the job. The second is dealing with new acquisitions and preparing objects for loan. Um, the museum sends a lot of objects to various institutions all around the world every year and we uh, try and ensure that they're mounted and framed in such a way that they don't um, suffer any damage in that sort of transport process. And the third part of the job um, is I suppose what you could call collection to care which is um, essentially improving the condition of objects in the collection and their storage and that's to really make these objects more accessible to members of the public and researchers and that kind of thing when they come and see them. Um, so on, I suppose, you know, most, nearly every museum really suffers from lack of storage or, you know, storage is a real big concern in museums. And um, so in advance of doing any big collections care project, you really need to know how much space the objects that you're going to be working on um, are going to require at the end of that project because often it's said and it's probably true that objects that come through conservation tend to grow, right? They get bigger um, because of the, generally because of the amount that we yeah. make for objects in the boxes that we put them in to store them safely. And so at the end of the project, often it's, you know, it's a third bigger again. That's <laughs> when, so there's this constant process of improving. Improving, yeah, and sort of rehousing and boxing and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but you really need to know where your objects are going to end up yeah. afterwards so that you've got a, a place yeah. earmarked for them in advance. And we tend to um, keep art and paper in uh, these standard sized mounts, um, yeah, which then go into these bespoke things called, these are called slander boxes. Yeah. And these are made to fit a particular size amount and a certain number of them. And what are the amounts made out of? So this is really cool stuff. This is 100% cotton. Well, I, know, I think it's cool. 100% <laughs> 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 um, cotton, yeah. um, it's totally acid free. And, you know, there's been a real development in materials uh, over the last, you know, 20, 30, mm -hmm. 40 years. And so we can be pretty confident that these mounts are going to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. Once these objects are mounted and boxed like this, you know, they're really well set. Yeah. You know, things will obviously change and maybe in another 100 years people will say, what on earth are we doing using yeah. that mount? But, um, you know, we're pretty confident that compared to certainly earlier mounts, yeah. like the ones we're going to talk about a bit later on, that these are really uh, safe. I'm going to just pedal back a second, mm -hmm. um, partly to show everyone watching how awesome this workshop is. Sure, yeah. So this yeah, is yeah. where you are... So this is where I'm based, yeah. yeah. Um, there are two studios. One next door is generally, we consider the kind of wet room, which is where if we're going to do any wet treatments like washing or things like that, we'll do that next door. And then in here, it's mostly dry material. And it's really nice to have these big benches um, because actually, you know, some objects can be pretty big and we just might need nice, clean, um, well-lit 
uh, spaces. So yeah, it's a nice place to work. And for those of you who've visited the museum but have never been backstage, you would never know this is here. <laughs> so <laughs> this is actually lot, only the second time yeah. I've been in this space because yeah. the Fitzwilliam is so big and there are so many different specialists working kind of behind yeah. closed doors. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to tell you how you get into here, I'll just leave you guessing. <laughs> um, so, again, before we sort of start talking about the collection, uh -huh. I'll just say if you have any questions, just write them in the comments, and um, Rich, who's behind the camera, will kind of feed them to us and we'll do yeah. our best to answer them. So, the collection. So, the print collection <laughs> yeah. um, is at the Fitzgerald is really uh, huge and amazingly rich. It's really, you know, a, a great highlight of the museum I think um, and the core of the collection I suppose are the Fitzwilliam albums we've got one here which um, is an album of engravings not much tense but engravings by a guy called Henrik Goltzius who was a really significant um, printmaker yeah. um, so I don't know you know you can just get a, get an idea of just how huge and comprehensive this, you know, this is just one album. Um, Fitzwilliam, who was the founder of the museum, was a really serious print collector. And so at the time of his death, there were 198 albums, um, and they contained somewhere in the region of 40,000 prints. Um, was that normal for an aristocrat his time? So we've well, got Fitzwilliam here. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, we should have mentioned that. That's him. <laughs> um, this is actually a mezzotint, which is what we were hoping to talk about uh, fortuitously. Um, <laughs> and we do actually have an awful lot of copies of this particular <laughs> print. Um, so yeah, I guess you know, it wasn't uncommon for people to collect prints, um, and it also wasn't uncommon for them to paste them to albums. I think the thing that distinguishes Fitzwilliam was um, you know, the size of his collection, which is really significant, but also um, the quality of it. I, I, there's very little documentary evidence um, explaining how Fitzwilliam went about his print collecting. But there's one, uh, so sometimes he bought intact albums from other sources, but on the whole, I think he bought individual sheets or groups of sheets, mm -hmm. which he then took real care in arranging on an album page. Um, and then when I think he felt that that part of the collection was subsequently, you know, was, was um, complete, he would have them bound into these albums. So they're sort of a bit like an 18th century coffee table book, in a way. Yeah, a <laughs> really expensive one, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they're, you know, it's, yeah, they're you know, really astonishing things. They're not all this size, yeah. some are even bigger, <laughs> and they've really become very unwieldy. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really fabulous things. And prints are, so could you just sort of tell us a bit about what's the difference between a print and just a kind of right. coloring or? Well, prints are obviously a reproductive yes. process and um, what we're looking at here are engravings, um, mezzotint. So there's a, there's a group of printmaking techniques called intaglio, yeah. which um, covers uh, engravings, etchings, dry point, mezzotint. Um, and essentially you have a metal plate where you incise marks into that plate and then those marks or grooves hold the ink which is then transferred to a piece of paper under the pressure of a printing yeah. press. Um, so essentially, this is a bit of a generalisation, but on the whole, intaglio prints usually result in kind of images made up of line, right? Yeah. So to get tone, you would cross hatch. Yeah. You know, these lines, that kind of thing. I don't know if Rich can get close, but if you look at this one, there's some really good cross hatching. Yeah, 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 that kind of thing. Yeah. But mezzotint, even though they're in tagli process, um, it's slightly different. So, mezzotint is all about tone, it's yeah. about light and dark, um, and that's because of the way uh, the plates are prepared. Um, so, these are all mezzotint, sort of apart from the, the um, engravings mm -hmm. album. And um, a mezzotint plate, essentially, we're talk the time we're talking, um, uh, yeah, at uh, the time we're talking, we're, we're mostly looking at uh, copper plates. Yeah. Um, and you would prepare the plate with what's called a ground, where you essentially use one of these things, which is a mezzotint rocker. Um, and what you would do is 
work this up and down the plate in really tight lines and you do this endlessly and then you overlap these rocked marks and then you might turn through 15 degrees and do the whole thing again so essentially you're roughing up the entire surface of the plate yeah. and, it, and the rocker leaves little pits and little burrs of copper everywhere or really tight dense um, uh, systematic kind of approach to covering a plate and then you cover that with ink and, and all those little pits and burrs really absorb lots and lots of ink um, and so that then transfers to the paper so if you prepared a plate and then you inked it up and you printed it without doing any artwork on it it would print totally black yeah. and you get the image by scraping away those burrs and those pits gradually mm -hmm. from black to white through grey to white um, and that's how you create the yeah. medicine image and so um, the result is these, are these really, really rich velvety blacks, and that's why Mexican was so good for portraits and for depicting fabric and cloth and that kind of thing, but also for uh, reproductive purposes like copying paintings. Yeah. Um, so that's why it was so um, good for those for those reasons. So presumably, in a in an era where there's and it sort of sounds. Silly to say it out loud, but actually, you know, there's no photography. Right, there's right, no right, right, right. Kind of and also, most prints are just line, right? Yeah. So um, these rich, yeah. sort of three-dimensional, um, atmospheric prints were, I think, quite a big deal, and they became a really big deal in England. Um, getting back to the album, sorry, just <laughs> briefly. The yeah. reason um, why we're talking about these prints today is that there were two Fitzwilliam albums that were full of metatints. And having said how important the bindings are and how significant these albums are, it's strange to say, but those two albums were disbound in the early 20th century. So why, why would they...? Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why? It's, yeah, it's curious. But actually, yeah. um, I think it's because they realised that the album format, the yeah. turning of the pages, was um, damaging these metatints. Because if we go back to the, you know, this idea that the, the surface is really rich and yeah. full of ink, the fact that every time you turn a page, that surface is getting yeah. rubbed against the opposite yeah. page, and so it was really braiding these, you know, really rich prints. And um, so I think that was recognised, and so it was decided to disbind the two uh, albums, and then there were the prints from those albums was put into mounts mm -hmm. and stored that way. So it, so the ink is again, it's a question, of total ignorance. Yeah. The, the ink is fit. So if I if I touched it, because well, it's no, so you, rich, I wouldn't get. Yeah. Black fingers, or well, you might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with metatints, I mean, on the whole, with print, no, yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you don't really want to touch them if you can possibly avoid it. But with metatints, the surface is so vulnerable mm. that you know a fingerprint might well show up, and, and certainly if you caught it with your nail or something like that, it would mark, and, and there's no getting that back. So, um, we have to be really careful when we're storing these prints. And, and handling them and moving them around and all sorts of things like that because the surface is so rich. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's what's so nice about metatints is that, you know, that when you look at them under mag magnification, yeah. you can see all the pits and, you know, all these kind of the rich surface of the texture. So it's great. Yeah. yeah. You showed me. Just oh, yeah, now, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you can just see how rich the yeah. surface is. I don't know if you can make it out, but you can even possibly in the whites see where these burrs and these pits where the ink is still being held. Um, I don't know if you can make that out, but the detail is astonishing. I mean, this is really um, the high watermark of um, metatin <laughs> engraving. This is a guy, a printer called Valentine Green, after a, um, Joseph Wright of Derby painting. Um, but actually, if you compare it to the print next to it, which um, is about 100 years earlier, this is what this is uh, considered to be the first mezzotint by an English artist. Um, you can see that the ground is much more haphazard. If you, especially in the top two corners, you can see um, where they've applied, tried to apply this ground, and um, it's much sort of less. Uh, systematic and dense and um, so you can see a real development in just the practical um, approach to medicine making. Harry, you said 
just now that um, they were particularly popular in Britain? Yeah, they were. Um, I suppose it's difficult to know exactly what, why. I mean, um, I think it was timing was a big part of it, and also in, in say, for instance, France and Italy. I think there was a, already a very well established uh, school of engraving. Right. So, you know, they I don't think they felt they needed this. Um, but you know, by the time we're getting to this point, where um, you know it, it really reached a high watermark in English Mexican printing. Um, it was known on the continent as the English manner yeah. of engraving. So, you know, really, you know, it was dom dominant in England. Um, and looking at the prints I've been looking at for this um, project, I, you know, it seems like there wasn't anybody who was anybody that didn't have their portrait right. <laughs> done in Mexican. I mean, yeah. there's an awful lot of aristocratic fellows that I've been um, looking at. But these this are. They're not kind of as we would buy a print today, and we could have it as a poster, right. and it would be quite cheap. These are quite... Well, this is an interesting um, element, and it also it, it goes back to Fitzwilliam. So, you know, I was saying that, that there's little documentary evidence about how Fitzwilliam went about yeah. acquiring his print. But there is one letter, there's a draft letter that exists, and it's between Fitzwilliam and somebody who's working on his behalf buying prints, I think in Paris. And, um, Fitzwilliam, it's really fascinating because Fitzwilliam shows how much he knows about the different proofs and states yeah. of the prints that he's yeah. after. He really wants the best right. possible states and he knows which ones they are. So um, that's really telling. And I think in the um, collection, we'll just skip forward, but this, this print, for instance, yeah. um, is a proof before the engraved title. So this area at the bottom here would have a, the title of the either sitter or the painter that made the painting or whatever. So, but that engraving is done by another artist, a guy that specialises right. in engraved text. Right. So the mezzo tinta yeah. would do the portrait, they would clean up, you can see there's still some rogue mezzo tint rocking yeah. in this little border down here, they would clean that back and send the, send the plate off to the guy that did the engraving. So we know that this print from the plate is a really early one because it's before the uh, engraved text. And that occurs a lot in the Fitzwilliam print collections. I mean this one for instance is the same story, this yeah. is a proof before, I think it's the second state of three, and it's before the text has been applied. So we know that it's before the um, there was time for the plate to wear out, you know, wear down, because they're very soft, copper plates are really soft, and each time you ink it and print it, it gets abraded a bit. And so the earlier proofs are much, much richer than the later ones. I mean, funny enough, this print, sorry, just as an example of that, this print occurs in this book about printmaking, um, and it's to show... So this is an early impression, there's a detail of her face, and then this is a later impression as the plate is worn. Yeah. Um, so it might be if you saw this impression, you might think that looks nice, but it's only in comparison yeah. to the earlier one that yeah. you actually realise that you've got a really worn yeah. um, impression. But anyway, the, uh, getting back to your question, the, <laughs> finally, <laughs> the <laughs> richest impressions, you know, for real print connoisseurs, you know, there yeah. were people who really knew what they were doing, like this William. Um, and then maybe the, the plates got printed and printed, they got fed, you know, weaker and weaker, but the, you know, then they might send to the general public. Yeah. Um, it's not really, they weren't limited editions as we know them today, you know, if you owned the plate, I think you had the right to print prints from it yeah. until it wore out. I mean, you can work back into a Mexican plate, but it's never as good as the first. Um, proofs that come from that plate. So you have been working on a quite astonishingly yeah. huge project. Yeah. <laughs> so I yeah, yeah, yeah. But you were talking about how um, Fitzwilliam's original album... Yeah, so they own. were... Yeah, yeah. so the, the Mexican albums, essentially the pages were cut, the, the album pages were cut out, and then they were placed in mounts a bit like this one. Um, which, so it's a window mount on the front and then there's a 
backboard on the back and um, over time these mounts have become really degraded and brittle. When you open the drawer where these mounts are stored, this amazing smell of kind of acidic <laughs> board comes <laughs> wafting out, it's really horrible. Um, and also, uh, these prints have been drummed down, essentially they've been stuck around the edges. And so you can maybe see, if we can torch, um, that they are distorted. Can you, can you make that Yeah, out? you can, yeah. Um, and so where they're raised, they might be rubbing against the mount on top, you know, they're still not hugely safe. And of course, we, we wouldn't show them in these mounts, they're really discoloured and acidic, and so we really want to do something about that. Um, the problem slightly in taking a mount like this off is it's obviously all stuck together. Yeah. And we don't really know what's stuck to what. We don't know if the print, the front mount is stuck to the print, or the back board is stuck to the print, or the two boards are stuck together and the print is hovering inside. So you have to approach it really carefully. Um, and essentially what we do is we um, split the board with a, a Teflon spatula, which I'll show you one of those if you're interested. Um, Teflon spatula. Teflon spatula. Every home should have one. Yeah. So a bit like this. Like, That's like yeah. from Superman. Yeah. They're really great. They're really cool things. Um, <laughs> so they're really smooth and slippy. Yeah. Um, and so with this degraded board, you can get in between the layers of the board and gently with one of these spatulas poke around and essentially split the yeah. board through its thickness. And you keep doing that, reducing, reducing, and reducing until you get to the print. And you can try and work out whether the mount is stuck to the print or whether it's going to detach. And anyway, so we, we remove the mounts like that. So I'm going to squeeze through. And um, this one, for instance, the one under here, I think, has had its backboard removed. So. Um, this is the adhesive that was stuck to the backboard. Um, but then you can see that there's another layer of adhesive here, uh, which has actually stuck the print into the mount. And, that, and sadly, this print is not on an album page. This is the back of the print. Yeah. So there is glue on the front of the print. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have to remove that very carefully. Um, but on the whole, once they've been removed, they look something a little bit like this. So this is on an album page, which is great. Um, and it's great for a couple of reasons. It means that this glue is not over the front of the print. Yeah. But also, if you notice down here, there's a little number. Um, an early curator in the collection went through the Fitzwilliam albums and numbered each print. And um, so these numbers help us understand the order that the mezzotints were in Fitzwilliam's yeah. album. And so part of this project is actually to try and reveal these numbers so that the curators can um, re-establish the order that they, they were in. Um, so we're working, while well, I'm working through the collection, I've done about 300 of these <laughs> prints so far to this <laughs> state. Um, and then we put them in these folders. And this is a sort of temporary solution. Yeah. It, um, I think once the documentation work has been done about the numbering and the order, we hopefully will be able to revisit these and, and maybe lift the prints from these album pages to stop this sort of distortion happening and then maybe press them and possibly wash some of them depending on whether they're discolored. Wash them? Yeah, you can... <laughs> With water? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's not... Um, common treatment in right. paper conservation to wash yeah. prints and drawings. You, with Metzotins, you again, you have to be really careful because, you know, going back to this idea about the surface, yeah. you have to filter the water really carefully because if there's any um, calcium or other particles in the water, wa um, these prints expand when they're wet, these particles can get trapped and then the prints will shrink back and so yeah. You re and they'll show up on these black yeah. blacks. Um, so washing metastins, you have to be really, really careful about checking that your yeah. water's really well filtered. But it's not impossible to wash them if, if they're discoloured. Yeah. Obviously, we try and do the very least we can to sort of stabilise these prints um, on the whole. And there's 
as I understand it, as you said, there's no plan to actually display these. This is just a really good example of the kind of work right, that, that goes on. Yeah. Yeah, specialists like you are doing all the time behind the scenes. That it's just about making sure the collection is. Yeah, just to try and prove yeah. their condition. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, it might well be that you know once these objects, if eventually some of them are mounted and um, conserved and mounted, that you know that there will be a show of them. I would hope because I think there's some real. Um, treasures in the yeah. collection. Um, so yeah, with any luck that, that might happen. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten something. <laughs> <laughs> well, if um, you have any questions, viewers, um, you know, when you're watching this and we're not live, leave a question. Or lots, of, lots of people yeah. have said hello. Um, <laughs> but also um, how amazing this is. Uh, and Mary Webster's just said she loves the museum. She's yeah. been here a few times and she's from Birmingham. Oh, right. <laughs> The one thing I did mean to mention was, um, if you want to know a bit more about the Fitzwilliam albums, the print albums, um, a little while ago, a couple of years ago, during the bicentenary celebrations of the family of Fitzwilliam, um, there were a bunch of short films made um, highlighting objects in the collection and grouped objects. And one of the curators uh, in the, the Department of Paintings, Prints and Drawings called Eleanor Ling, who deals with the print collection, she made a short film about Fitzwilliam albums, and she speaks really uh, eloquently, far more eloquently than I do, um, and in much more detail about the uh, print albums and how important they are. So if you want to know a bit more about that, I really recommend you watch the film. I think it's available on YouTube. Um, yeah, and I highly recommend it. Well. Thank you so much, Harry. Not at all. I've learned loads. I hope everyone watching has too. Um, we will be back in how long, which? Uh, we're back at 12 in an hour. Back at 12, we'll be yep. in a completely different part of the museum um, talking about how you make them out. But yes, so thanks everyone. Okay, cheerio. Bye. Bye.